Hello, everyone, and welcome to our conversation with Phyllis Michael Wong, the author of We Kept Our Towns Going. This is a phenomenal book if you haven't read it. It's also a 2023 Michigan Notable Book winning book. So go ahead and check it out. It's from Michigan State Press. And um, we're just going to hop in and talk first. I'll let Phyllis introduce herself. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for having me, Melinda. My name is Phyllis Wong, and um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself initially. In terms of personal information, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in a community where scientists, wineries, and ranchers lived all together. It was a very interesting and very fun childhood. Um, I left, I've lived outside of California more than I've lived in California. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to have traveled many, many places and lived in many, many places in America. We live in a very beautiful country. As a result of that, I've lived in some very interesting places where I learned to enjoy hiking, hiking at 14,000 feet, gardening, gardening in dry climates, gardening in wet climates, and, and cooking, cooking what I grow. One of my most fond memories is as a new mom, um, gardening, a piece of land that was 80 feet by 80 feet. It was huge. But because of that, and because I am a curious person and I like to experiment and try new things, I learned a lot about cooking, what it means to cook from the garden. So um, those are some of the things that I have great, great pleasure doing. I also have a very special interest as a result of my time in Michigan's Upper Peninsula where I was already in love with Mother Nature and photographing Mother Nature. But in Marquette, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula, where winters, what I call the season of white, could be six months, I fell in love with the season of white. I don't, I rarely call it winter. I call it the season of white. And many of my photos are, um, I categorize as the study of white, its sculptural effects, and it's quite, quite beautiful. So that's a bit about Phyllis. Um, as I said, I grew up in California. I now live in New England, another beautiful place to live that does have four seasons. Professionally though, um, I've been involved in higher education most of my adult life. Um, and probably about over th um, three decades involved in um, education. I taught online when that was brand new in the 90s for people. I've taught in person. I've taught collaborative, collaboratively in schools where they had programs and not individual courses. And I've taught at universities too. And I've trained faculty. So I have a, an extensive um, experience in education, higher education. And the last two decades were spent um, uh, being a first lady, working as a first lady in two universities. Um, it's not common knowledge, but I am now another first lady at another university, and it's a joy to do that. So I've worked in education for a long time. I think my time as a first lady was a time in which it gave me the freedom to continue teaching mm -hmm. in the community, being with people, not just the faculty and staff, but in the community itself. So every place um, we lived where my husband was running an institution, that's what I decided to do. I could no longer teach in the classroom, but I could still teach and I could still learn. More importantly, I could learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I mean, as someone who has spent a lot of time in education and libraries, it's true. Mm -hmm. You never stop learning. You never stop teaching. And uh, it's just, it's wonderful. It's, I didn't realize too, that you were from California. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> well, thank you for giving us some of that background on yourself. You know, my big question for you to kind of to round out who you are, how did you become a writer? Because <laughs> this is, I know your, your first book. This is my first book. Thank you for saying that. <sighs> there are probably lots of reasons, but Probably one of the key reasons is that I grew up in a household where books were important. And my parents nurtured reading, 
But more than reading, they nurtured talking, discussing things, and thinking about things. Um, our dinners were long dinners because that's what we got to do. There were many of us in the family. So I think maybe that's probably how I began initially. Um, I will admit, as I didn't expect to have this question, but that when I was in grade school, I actually had something published in a newspaper. It was a story I wrote. It was a surprise. I just took it in stride. And then I think later on in my school, particularly um, in my graduate school work, where I had come upon an idea that nobody, and this is another thing that I apparently like to do, is to come up with, do things that most people have not considered doing. It's rare. So um, I ended up interviewing a whole bunch of people because I was interested in the discovery of childhood in the United States. Oh. And that's and that's um, a piece that I began looking into the history of it. And then I felt, well, I think I should interview some people who were children in this particular area where I lived. And so I did. And I learned also, too, that, that it was a very natural thing for me to do because I enjoy being around people. I enjoy talking and listening to people. Mm-hmm. So I I did that, and and as I said earlier, when I when we moved to um, uh, Marquette, Michigan, and I happened upon as I was getting to know the community and being in the community, I happened upon a piece of history that few people had talked about, or even few people had known about, and so as a result of that, I thought, well, let me learn a little bit more. And every little bit more, every little interview resulted in another interview. <laughs> and, and um, you know, in many, many people I talked to, probably close to 150 people that I have records of that I actually talked to about their communities and in particular about the um, importance of the factory that, that was in these two towns. Wow. So... I, I guess it just sort of, I'm willing to take on things. I guess maybe that's another way of saying this. I, I'm not afraid to try something I've never tried before. Mm. I'm not afraid to be in communities where I've never known anyone and where I've never lived. I consider it a wonderful experience and a wonderful journey. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I think that's incredible too, to think about, you know, you didn't think of yourself as your writer. You really are someone you like to ask questions. You like to listen to people. And I, I mean, I wonder how that plays into your writing process, because it sounds mm-hmm. like, especially with this book, I mean, it is a lot of it's just stories. You're you're chronicling those stories. Yes. When I started gathering all of these stories, I didn't intend to write. Mm. I intended I intended for some um, experienced historian someone who had lots of experience, more than Phyllis had, <laughs> to take this on. And then, um, I know I'm jumping around and you probably won't have to ask me this question again. In 2010, in 2010, I was giving a talk for Women's History Month at Northern Michigan University. And during the course of my talk, in which I had um, invited uh, former workers to attend so that people could meet them and listen to them. Mm. What came out of that was the realization that um, I knew these women. I knew them because I had been interviewing them, many, many of them, and their voices and um, their stories were in my head. And I just felt that it was probably better that I try to tackle this and try to tell their stories Mm -hmm. they had already trusted you with those stories you you were the person to tell them yeah Yeah. Uh, thank you for saying that trust Mm -hmm. trust is a very important thing when someone is going to talk about themselves Mm -hmm. and about their history how do you demonstrate that you are listening and that you value Mm -hmm. what they are saying and that was something that i thought about a lot Mm -hmm. So much so that soon after beginning these interviews, I wanted to find, besides saying thank you, tangible ways 
to demonstrate that I valued them. So sometimes I might bring some chocolates to share or a homemade bread or something like that. But it was really, really important for me to value them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think because of that, what I call the word got around that this person, Phyllis Wong, um, who was a, a member of the community, but not from the UP, she wasn't a Uper. Mm -hmm. You could trust her because she believed in your story. She was interested in your stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is huge. Just showing that you you value someone, you value their story. Mm -hmm. um, and now you kind of talked about how you got the idea to write the book. How did you initially come up with the idea to even start researching Gossard Girls, the factory? <laughs> <laughs> that was that that was something else again that wasn't planned. Lots of things in my life have not been planned, but I'm a good adventurer. I can take a journey. <laughs> I love it. I can. So um, I learned about the factory because I was doing a research paper with another a friend of mine, we were a member of a, um, a club called the Century Club. And every year we took, we examine large, big questions in the world, big questions. And every member did some research on that. Well, one year, the, the idea was to um, uh, do research on women who made a difference mm. all over the world. Well, I felt that it was incumbent upon me, and besides that, I like history, to dig into local history. So again, with this friend, we we um, we it, we found some people to interview who knew a woman named Geraldine Gordon DeFont. Mm -hmm. And um, there was information, biographical information available on her, but we also felt that it might be important to talk to people who might have known her other than family members. So we did. We we interviewed a couple of business people and we interviewed about three to five women who worked at the factory. I can't remember how I got their names. Um, but in the in, during the interview, um, we, we had many questions that we were asking them, of which there were only a small number of questions about if they knew Geraldine Gordon DeFont. Well, it turns out that um, three of them knew of her, but didn't really know her and didn't work when she was helping organize. So the information that we had on Geraldine was um, modest at bet. However, having said that, um, she was a highly respected woman who demonstrated, I might add, that she cared for the workers. Mm. And that's how she was able to be so successful. Well, <clears throat> Phyllis became much more interested in the stories about the factory. I got sidelined and that began this wonderful journey that I have, I had been on and um, talking to women and men and children and husbands and community people, anybody who wanted to talk about what a factory did in their community, not the factory, but the people, mm -hmm. what the women did in their community. So it, again, it was happenstance that I ended up talking to so many Gossard girls. It didn't start out that way, but in life, I've learned that in life there are many there are many roads in this one big road of life, and if you just are willing to take off to you know take a tangent, get off get off the main road, mm -hmm. and see where that leads you, you never know what will happen. Sometimes you come up with an award winning book. <laughs> <laughs> Good happen to you. Yes, yes. I know the community is just ecstatic. Ecstatic, not just Ishpeming. Marquette mm -hmm. County is ecstatic about um how the book has been making its way in the world. Mm -hmm. It is a huge point of pride. It is, and you were right, how you said at the beginning, it's a story that I mean, I've born and raised in Michigan. I had mm -hmm. never heard of this story mm -hmm. and uh, about these women and about this factory. So to think that, you know, I'm not the only one, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So just to be able to bring light to this mm -hmm. dynamic story, dynamic place, dynamic people and in their own voices too. Um, yes. And so when 
brings us back to I think your some of your earlier part of your earlier question about about putting the book together, writing the book. Mm -hmm. So there was a time in which I had to figure things out. I knew I knew the voices needed to be out there, but how how do I do that? And how do I um, convey this idea in a compelling way to a publisher? Mm -hmm. um, because I had received feedback um, about readers' reactions to the way the book was organized. And um, for me, this story was important because you had the voices of assembly line workers. You didn't have, you know, the um, the manager, the business people weighing in on this. You had, and this is rare to have this happen, rare. And so I, I, I needed to steal myself, S-T-E-E-L, <laughs> so that, you know, I could talk persuasively to people when they felt that I had too many voices. Mm. Because you're like, nope, you <laughs> got to get the whole picture. Um, Yeah, when I think about history, Melinda, history is not even 10 people telling the same story. If there's a if there's an opportunity to gather more voices, isn't the piece richer? Yes. Yes. <laughs> isn't it close? Close. Not accurate, but close to being the history. I love it. That, that's a, you're a true historian. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess this is a good question to like a good segue into our next question of how would you define this work? Because mm -hmm. obviously histor history, but mm -hmm. it's more than that. It it is, and I'm afraid I'm I'm not very good at explaining this. I I I probably would get get back to the the um the basics. It's a nonfiction book about ordinary women laborers who sold corsets and bras in factories, two factories in Ishpeming and Gwyn. But I would also add, and this is a little bit long and lengthy, and I apologize for that, but it's also about women working 100 years ago in a world that was vastly different than 2023. The rights of women had just begun to get their voice, their vote in 1920. And so women... Women were expected to be wives and to raise families, and many of them did, and they were good at it. But they also had other talents and the opportunity for them to help the family and the community was something that they learned about and were and many of them refused to give up it when pressured by a family member or um, a partner or something like that. But they, they knew what they were doing. So that they had to navigate this very different time. What did it mean to be an activist in 1940? What did it mean to be on the picket line? Women picketing for women. Mm -hmm. That was that was not as common. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um it's a complicated, I think it's a complicated history. And I my hope is that um more. Uh, or historians or people with more experience than Phyllis will will weigh in um, and talk about the unintended consequences of what these women have done. I know that the 1960s, they paved the way, other communities did too, but rest assured, these women in Marquette County probably over 1500 of them if you can you know if you add up all of them over six decades mm -hmm. made an impact at a time when you know women were not expected to be impactful in this kind of way mm. that's a good way of putting it yeah they were not expected to and, and this you know kind of brings me to i feel like we've touched on it in different questions and different parts of the conversation mm -hmm. of what kind of is your favorite characters, your favorite pieces mm -hmm. within the book? I mean, there's so many voices, so I know it's probably impossible to choose your favorite people, <laughs> but but what were maybe some of your favorite stories mm -hmm. from the book? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you're right. There are so many. I, I interviewed so many. I, I just can't pick a, a particular person. What I do love about um, the book is that there are so many voices that you get lots of information and lots of pictures. But there are some. Elaine Peterson, for example, is one who I interviewed probably, oh, well, well, maybe 40 hours. I don't know. I, I never kept track of it because sometimes uh, we inter uh, I interviewed her at home, sometimes at the factory, sometimes at Ralph's Italian Deli, um, uh, sometimes on the phone, sometimes in a letter. So um, her her contributions to the book could not be overstated, particularly chapter two, um, could not be overstated. Um, I have a particular fondness for those strong women who, before they were 16, had to make difficult decisions about stopping their education. That impresses me. I am really impressed too. I don't mention enough the men. I I I interviewed a handful of men, probably about eight, eight to ten of them, but their stories are wonderful stories about what it was like to what it was like to work in a woman-dominated factory. As this one man told me, I you know it was nothing to be walking around with an undergarment over my shoulder. He was a cutter and had to cut, you know had to do things. So it was something that they just got used to, and they it was a place that people most people enjoyed to work. It was like a family. Mm -hmm. The stories by the children of Gossard workers are humorous. <laughs> Jerry Haru's discussion about his stay-at-home father in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Mike Morissette's stories about having the run of the Ishpeming factory because both of his parents worked there and what he got to do to learn, but just enjoy. Mm -hmm. And even, well, this is something for another time, the Gossard quilt. That um, that journey, four months, five month journey of of the remnants into the quilt is a very special journey that touched um, not just the people who made the quilt, but community people, because then that became a vehicle, a vehicle to tell people, a visual to tell people about what happened. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are great. I, you know, the taking a little turn from the book itself, what did it mean to you to have this book selected as a Michigan Notable book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, well, I suppose, first of all, as a new author, a first time author, who is a senior citizen? I am in. I am in my seventies. I don't mind saying that. Um, it was. I was overwhelmed, honored, proud, proud because I know that the designation of it as a notable book, what it implies, it means that more people will set their eyes on it. What does that mean? It means more people will know their stories mm. and that's why that's why i wrote the book for the stories for their stories so people would know and that in turn might inspire others to uncover their own what i call hidden stories but hopefully not hidden for very long about what ordinary people did with what they had what they had is what you do with what you have, mm -hmm. how you can make a difference with what you have. Yeah. They did. They sure so, did. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I can't thank Notable Books enough for and all the people that read the books for looking at it with and understanding what this piece means for Michigan. Yeah. Michigan, not just the UP. Michigan and and 
other places too, but I know the award is for Michigan. And um, hopefully, I know, actually, I know other people have read the book who do not live in Michigan. So it is making its way. It is making its way. Yeah. Because Michigan stories, they're American stories. They're, they're (laughs) universal stories. Yeah. But we want to make sure, you know, that piece of Michigan, you know, who we are as a state is told. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, you're saying, you know, people outside of Michigan have read the book and we've been talking about why it's important to read this book and get this stories. But I guess here's another chance for you to to say it. Uh, why do you think people should read your book? Because it's time to it's time to tell the stories. It's time to tell the history, the history of what women have done, women working in ways that we know they work, but we haven't really called their memories. We haven't talked to them. We haven't listened to them to see what it meant. Mm. We are obligated, obligated to, to make sure that we tell as much of the American story as possible. We are a rich nation full of many different kinds of people. Let's hear Let's continue to hear more voices, more diverse voices in that area. I mean, I feel inspired. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And kind of your way to sort of promote more stories that need to be told and need to be heard. Are there any writers or works that you think that you are reading and that you think others should be reading? Hmm. Well, right now I'm reading things that um, are kind of funny. I just That's finished, good too. I just finished reading The Princess Bride. Yes. <laughs> That's a fun one. <laughs> As you know, I, I like to read all kinds of things, humorous things. Um, there are I like to read Rebecca Solnit's works because she's a person I I admire her because she knows how to measure the weight of words. Um she has a gift for that. And so I really, really appreciate that. Um, I would, I still read UP writers. One of my favorites is John Smolens. Mm-hmm. He's a good, good writer. He, I have long admired him. So um, those are probably the current ones that I am reading. I belong to two book clubs. And so I read a lot of local stuff right now, local meaning local to Massachusetts. Mm. Uh, and, but in doing that, I also learn that, yes, it's a different state, but people, people have the same yearnings, mm-hmm. the same wants, same journeys. So just different writers. Yeah. I love it. That's wonderful. And John Smolens, he, he he is a favorite. He's also a many time Michigan Notable Book author too. So yes, yes. Well, it was such a pleasure talking with you, Phyllis. And I, I you know, again, we can't recommend this book enough. Mm-hmm. Read their stories, learn a little more about Michigan's history, about Michigan's women's history. Um, And just thank you again for being there and congratulations. Mm -hmm. Melinda, thank you very, very much. It is again, an honor to have been selected. I've enjoyed our conversation. Um, I got to talk a lot, but that's okay. Um, That's good. That's what we want to happen. I know. know. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, um, I look forward to um, reading more books by Michigan notable authors. Yeah, we'll have another list of 20 in January of 2024. (laughs) Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks again. It was great talking with you. Nice to talk to you too. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. All right, bye-bye.